So in terms of an outline, I want to um, talk to you a little bit about this concept of metabolic flexibility, metabolic inflexibility. This is something that Jim Hill and I have talked about a lot over the years, and we, I think, see, see that this is a very important concept related to obesity, diabetes, and metabolism. Um, talk to you a, a fair amount today about exercise, and Jim talked to you about physical fitness, elite athletes, and exercise, and why it's important in maintaining a healthy metabolism. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time today talking about that, um, particularly in the context of diabetes and obesity. Um, say a few things about substrate metabolism or fuel metabolism um, as it relates to the etiology or pathophysiology of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And then talk to you about some of our exercise and weight loss interventions um, and how we've looked at how we can improve broken metabolism. What works, what might not work, what does work, uh, etc. And then at the end, I'm going to um, uh, talk to you a little bit about some studies that we've been doing uh, to really <coughs> try to get at some of the underpinnings or mechanisms of metabolic flexibility, impaired metabolism, broken metabolism, and obesity, uh, and whether these can be affected again by weight loss, exercise programs, etc. So. What do I mean by metabolic flexibility? Well, if you look at our day-to-day -day lives when we go from sleeping after an overnight fast, how our bodies rely on fat metabolism for energy, and then we eat a meal, whether it's high carb, high fat, our bodies can respond to that by adapting and, like Jim said, utilizing what fuel is presented, whether it's fat calories, carbohydrate calories, Etc. We can also talk about metabolic flexibility in terms of exercise. We know that when we go from resting to exercise, our bodies adapt in terms of fuel preference, uh, carbohydrate versus fat, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Versus a situation of metabolic inflexibility, when the body doesn't adapt very well to the situation, when you go from an overnight fast to feeding, for example. Um, you've probably heard about insulin resistance, and that's, I'll talk a little bit about that. Insulin resistance <coughs> is a form of metabolic inflexibility. Me insulin resistance, as I'll talk about, is really a hallmark characteristic of uh, type 2 diabetes and most, most people with, with obesity. So when we go from rest to exercise, um, again, our bodies adapt depending on the exercise intensity. I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time ab about this, but I want to put it into context because you've probably heard of aerobic metabolism, anaerobic metabolism, and so our, our muscles in particular have different energy sources that we tap into when we go from high intensity, short bursts of physical activity, um, you know, exercise lasting a few seconds to exercise lasting you know, minutes to hours. And so I'm not going to really talk about the anaerobic energy systems because this is the immediate uh, energy sources that we use, like for exercise, for example. Um, anaerobic uh, metabolism is completely fueled by carbohydrate. So when you have these high, uh, you know, high intensity, short bursts of energy, you're not using fat for that. You're using all carbohydrates. So when we ask ourselves, what are carbohydrates good for? Do we need them? Do we not, do we not need them? We certainly need them if we're doing high intensity uh, exercise. Certainly elite athletes and our ancestors, our predecessors, when they were running away from wild animals, needed high intensity exercise. So you definitely need carbohydrates for the high intensity exercise. Now the longer, aerobic exercise, you can either use fat or carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are oxidized aerobically and so are fats. Fats are only metabolized or oxidized aerobically. You can't oxidize fats with anaerobic metabolism. Um, you need oxygen to, to, burn, to burn fat. But again, keep in mind that carbohydrates can be either burned without oxygen anaerobically or with oxygen aerobically. So when you get out to aerobic metabolism, exercise or activities lasting you know, minutes to hours, um, you can either burn fat <coughs> or carbohydrate. And so the body stores carbohydrate in the form of glycogen um, or glucose um, 
you don't store much in the blood, obviously, but you store most of your carbohydrate in muscle or liver. So this is glycogen. When, when marathon runners, for example, carbohydrate <coughs> load, they're really trying to load their muscles full of glycogen because these you know, competitive runners, they're really tapping into their carbohydrate stores during exercise and they need to maximize these carbohydrate stores to um, as, as much as possible. Uh, because this is, is really a limiting um, uh, source of, of fuel. You can only store so much carbohydrate in the liver and muscle. It's really a, a finite or limited um, storage. Fat, on the other hand, we have an almost unlimited amount of storage capacity for fat. So even just the average normal weight 70 kilo person can store about 135,000 calories in adipose tissue. Now, if a person is obese and they have 50% body fat and they weigh 140 kilos, obviously this goes up to you know, 250,000, 300,000 calories of, of uh, fat. And if you do the back of the envelope calculation, um, you can run about 100 back-to-back -back marathons on your stored adipose tissue. So again, almost <laughs> unlimited amount of adipose tissue to provide energy. So that's not limiting, but carbohydrate stores are indeed limiting. So I want to put this in historical perspective because look at the date of this publication, 1939. Two Scandinavians, uh, Christensen and Hansen, uh, produced some of the very early work looking at the effects of exercise on metabolism. And what they did in these studies, um, these were just individuals um, in these different studies, and what they showed was that the higher the exercise intensity was related to more carbohydrate burning, lower exercise intensity um, down here is less uh, fat burning. So this is a principle that we know today very well, that the higher intensity exercise, use more carbohydrate, the lower intensity exercise, you, you're using more fat. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have jumped on a treadmill or a stepping machine, and it's got this optimal fat burning zone kind of thing on there. That is really not based on a lot of research. Um, it's really kind of rough. Um, you know, when you step on the machine, it's like heart rate, uh, percentage, um, this kind of thing. But there's not a lot of uh, concrete evidence to show that, at least for an individual, that this is an optimal fat burning range. We know generally that medium intensity exercise is your optimal fat burning range. And you look back in the 1930s and we had pretty good evidence that this was the case here because this would be about a medium intensity exercise and this is where people are burning the most, most fat. And so this is, sorry for the Mac to PC conversion here. Um, <laughs> get on my Mac bandwagon here. The world should be Mac and not uh, Windows. But uh, anyway, um, I can still take you through this. What this study is showing basically that they took highly trained cyclists in this study and they did low, medium, and high intensity exercise. And as you would expect, when you go low, medium, and high intensity exercise, you burn more energy, just total energy. The proportion of energy changes though. When you go from low to medium intensity exercise is where you burn the most fat. And then when you go to more high intensity exercise, like a really high interval training type of intensity, you actually decrease your fat burning. So there is this optimal fat burning range um, that's more the medium intensity. But you know, when you get on the treadmill and it says that this is the optimal fat burning range, this is a very general uh, kind of range. It's not really individualized for, for each person. So the other thing that's important to, to keep in mind is that the longer you exercise, your substrate or your fuel metabolism mix changes as well. So this was a study in which they had people exercise for, as you can see, four to five hours. And the longer you exercise, your carbohydrate burning uh, starts to go down and your fat burning actually goes up over time. And there's a variety of reasons for this. One is because you're just running out of your carbohydrates. So you have to start using your fat because that's the only thing available when you start running out of carbohydrate. That's the example I use for the marathon runner. That's when they, they drop in their performance because their carbohydrates run out and they can't exercise at a high, high enough intensity, 
Um, so they basically have to really decrease their intensity. Um, they're going to lose the race. So carbohydrates are supporting this really high intensity exercise. The other important important point is that when you eat or drink carbohydrate drinks, etc., during exercise, it can really affect the energy that you're burning. So in this same study, what they did, they had subjects just drink water, and you can see that the carbohydrates, uh, the amount of carbohydrates that are being burned goes down over time. The amount of fat, calories that you burn goes up over time when you just drink water. But if you drink like a Gatorade solution or something, you maintain your carbohydrate <laughs> oxidation at the expense of burning less fat. So one of the messages I try to get across to people when they're engaged in our exercise and weight loss programs, if, if they're exercising for weight loss or, weight lo or body weight control, again, you've got enough fat to support all your energy needs during exercise unless you're, again, uh, exercising at really high intensities. So it's probably not a great idea to drink sugary drinks during exercise if you're trying to promote fat burning. So um, you're not going to uh, go hypoglycemic. Um, this is another misconception out there that, well, if I don't drink you know, sugar drinks during exercise, I'm going to go hypoglycemic, but um, <coughs> definitely not. The other important concept here is that exercise training can really affect how you burn the carbohydrate versus fat calories. The trained person is going to burn more fat calories during a given bout of exercise compared to somebody who's not trained. This is one of the classic training adaptations that we have, is that when we train, we increase our muscles' capacity for fat burning. Uh, we increase the muscles' ability to get oxygen into it. And as a result of that, we can simply burn more fat during exercise. So exercise is a very powerful uh, inducer of fat metabolism and training. Uh, can actually help you burn fat better, okay? So this concept has been, you know, uh, really beaten to death over the last uh, few decades. It was, you can, as you saw from the one study since the 1930s showing that as you increase exercise intensity, carbohydrate oxidation increases at the expense of decreased fat oxidation. Some people have called it this crossover concept in which you uh, you reach an, a point or a certain exercise intensity at which you start actually decreasing uh, fat oxidation and you really ramp up carbohydrate oxidation. So really this is saying that, again, there's this optimal exercise intensity for optimal uh, fat burning, if you will. Okay, so Exercise training, I want to spend a few minutes and talk about this because, I, again, I think it's an important concept because it really, as Jim alluded to earlier, it really sets our body up well to burn whatever energy is, uh, is, is thrown at it or whatever energy is stored in it in the case of carbohydrate or, or fat. So um, exercise, how do we measure exercise training? In the lab, we measure it with this parameter that some of you may have heard called VO2 max. It's the maximal aerobic capacity or the maximum capacity to transport and utilize oxygen during maximal, maximal exercise. And this is really what we have as the gold standard for measuring somebody's physical fitness. You take them in the lab, you measure how much oxygen they consume during maximal exercise, and this is their, this is their VO2 max. So um, I want to put this in context to what a resting metabolic rate uh, value is. Because when I talk to you about some of these values for VO2 max, uh, physical fitness of athletes and sedentary people, um, keep in mind that your resting metabolic rate, so just uh, not sleeping metabolic rate, but just lying down resting metabolic rate, is about three and a half milliliters of oxygen consumption per kilogram body weight per minute. And in um, exercise metabolism circles, this is often referred to as one met, metabolic equivalent. So when you hear one met, that's what it is. It's three and a half milliliters of oxygen consumed. Not, not inhaled oxygen or oxygen that you breathe, but oxygen that you're actually utilizing per, per minute, okay? 
So a very sedentary older person like we study in some of our aging and obesity research that we do, um, her VO2 max would be close to maybe 16 mils per kg per minute. So about five times um, a resting metabolic rate measurement. And there are a couple por important points to this, and we could, we could discuss this later on if you want, because I do a lot of aging research. And so for this older woman to cross a street is going to require her to walk at about 80 to 90% of her maximum to get across the street because her capacity is so low. Um, I had a paper reviewed once, and the reviews came back from the from the uh, you know peer reviewed paper, and the reviewer said these values are impossible. These are like heart failure patients, and I'm, I said, yeah, these are like heart failure patients. <laughs> They're very sedentary, uh, older people, so their physical fitness is horrendous. Now, if you look at a normal college age person or young adult, their VO2 max is going to be 45 to 50. Um, maybe if these people were taking the stairs, it might be a little <laughs> higher than that. Um, but that's, that's going to be about an average physical fitness level uh, of somebody. And you can see that that's um, three times uh, the fitness level of this sedentary, older, obese, uh, fairly low functional capacity woman here. Okay. Now, the fittest human being on the planet a few years ago was this Norwegian cross-country <laughs> skier. Uh, and he was 96 mils per kg, which is like Superman. I mean, that's unbelievable to have a VO2 max that high. Um, yeah, Lance Armstrong, I think, was about 85 pre or post EPO. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, this guy was probably on EPO. Was too. there a pre? Um, I don't know. You're from Texas. Yeah. You tell me. <laughs> was there a pre I'm not sure. But I mean, this is this is superhuman to have a physical fitness level level like this. Um, and so um, there are there are physical specimens with higher VO2 max than than this cross country skier racehorse is about double this. And again, this is per kilo body weight, not not just because the racehorse is is bigger, um, just because they're just more physically fit than any human. Um, if you had a copy of the slides, you may know what's coming. Does anybody know what? Fitter than a racehorse? A hummingbird. Mm. Well, hard to measure. <laughs> <laughs> these guys. Oh. Oh, yeah. So these guys, 240, and the fittest human on the planet was 96. So they're two and a half times as fit as this, uh, as the as the fittest fittest humans on the planet. Incidentally, you know what the diet is of these sled dogs? 90% fat. So these guys are fat burning machines. As opposed to this guy. <laughs> He's a carb burning machine, right? 100% glucose in their diet. And I think their VO2 max estimated is about 600. So, but they're not mammals, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a little out, out of my league when I start talking about hummingbird uh, VO2 max. <laughs> But the point here, sled dogs, 90% fat diet, super fit. Hummingbirds fly across the Gulf of Mexico nonstop. They don't ride on the backs of geese, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so they do fly on their own. Um, I think I read that they, they, uh, they eat about six grams of glucose a day. Um, super high metabolism. Um, but they're glucose burning machines. So like Jim said, my opinion is that if you're physically fit, if you're physically active, the body is well adapted to burn whatever energy is presented to it. Carbs, fat, doesn't matter, burns it efficiently, burns it well. So what about metabolic flexibility from going from fasting, again, in a condition which you should be burning a lot of fat, um, <laughs> because your liver is running out of glycogen after an overnight fast. Um, you know, I think we were made or evolved to basically have these periods of rest in which you store energy and be metabolically efficient, burn fat. And when you eat, um, you get an insulin response 
and depending on the composition of that meal, whether it's high carb or high, or high fat, you get an insulin response, and then this shifts your metabolism towards more fat metabolism to more carbohydrate meta metabolism. So the, again, the healthy response is to have this metabolic flexibility. You can adapt and burn whatever energy is presented. The body responds to insulin very well in the case of somebody who's very insulin sensitive versus somebody who is what we call insulin resistant. So insulin resistance, particularly in the muscle, is really important for the pathophysiology and the development of diabetes, right? Because when insulin resistance is present, this means that insulin is in the circulation. In fact, people with um, insulin resistance actually have very high insulin levels in the blood a lot of times. And the reason they have high insulin levels before they get frank or over diabetes, the pancreas it senses this insulin resistance somehow and it tries to overcome it. Because insulin's there, it's knocking on the door, but it's not getting in. The muscle's got some resistance to it, and it's intracellular properties of the muscle that's responsible for this insulin resistance that's causing insulin to not be able to do its job properly. So call it an impaired insulin metabolism, impaired insulin action, impaired insulin response, but this is what this insulin resistance is. You've got insulin, but it's not able to exert its effect in the cells, particularly in muscle, and liver and even adipose tissue. So again, the pancreas, the insulin secreting cells, tries to overcome this, it, if, and it does a good job for a while. And some people, not everybody, but in some people, the insulin just can't keep up. The pancreas fails, and this is what leads to frank hyperglycemia or type 2 diabetes. Even pre-diabetes, you've heard a lot about pre-diabetes, so glucose is just gradually go up. I mean, really, diabetes is just a number, right? It's 126 mgs per deciliter. Pre-diabetes is a number. Some would argue that it's all a continuum, right? So as the pancreas starts to fail, can't keep up with its insulin resistance, and your glucose levels start to creep up until you get a diagnosis of diabetes, okay? Now there's another side to this. Again, I'm coming back to the carbohydrate versus fat metabolism. During fasting, the fat cells are releasing fatty acids into the circulation, into the bloodstream. The muscles, healthy muscles anyway, are very good at taking up fat and burning them for energy. So in conditions of resting, fasting, after you haven't eaten for a while, the muscles are very good at burning fat, okay? Now, the liver is also very good at <clears throat> cranking out glucose because the brain needs glucose for energy. So even after prolonged fasting or even starvation, the liver is good at taking the fat that's being released by the fat cells. You've got fat cells that are releasing fat into the bloodstream. Liver takes these up and converts it into glucose. The liver's great at making glucose. In rats, the livers can take aluminum and make glucose. No, I'm just kidding, but <laughs> the liver is very good at making glucose out of amino acids, out of lactic acid, out of fats, etc., to provide glucose for the brain. Okay, so you've got this, um, again, metabolic flexibility situation that fasting, you burn fat. After a meal, you burn glucose. So I'm not going to go into all the details about this, but I want to basically say that there was a landmark paper back in the 1960s that really highlighted this yin and yang of fat and carbohydrate metabolism in the setting of diabetes and insulin resistance. And this theory now that people in the field call the Randall cycle, because Randall was the, the person who wrote this um, landmark paper, and basically what this paper said was that when you have an impairment in your body's ability to use glucose, you burn more fat. And when you have an impairment in your body's ability to burn fat, you burn more glucose. So again, there's this reciprocal regulation of burning fat and glucose that's important. 
And a lot of people use this to help explain diabetes, that, well, if your blood sugar is high, your glucose metabolism is not, is not working properly, you're not burning glucose, so you must be burning more fat. And that was true, that when you're not burning glucose in the setting of a meal or insulin stimulation, um, you burn more fat. But the conditions of fasting were much different. So this, this uh, Dennis McGarry, who, um, the late Dennis McGarry, he, he passed away uh, over a decade ago. He was from UT Southwestern. Um, really was important in the diabetes field because uh, he really promoted this idea and had a lot of uh, important research to back it up that diabetes was not just a disease of impaired sugar metabolism, but it was also a disease of impaired fat metabolism. And he wrote this paper, and it was based on his lecture that he gave at a, um, at a diabetes meeting back in the, in the early 90s. And the title of this was, What if Minkowski had been a goose egg? A goose egg. So a, a goose egg <laughs> means um, tasting, right? So Minkowski was a doctor who basically discovered diabetes by tasting glucose in the urine. That's how they died. This was before dipsticks, right? So they actually tasted. Who would want to take that job? <laughs> they actually tasted urine, and if it was sweet, the person had diabetes. And so his title was, you know, what if this doctor couldn't taste? Would we be talking about diabetes as a disease of impaired glucose metabolism, or would we be talking about diabetes as a disease of impaired fat metabolism? Because that's the angle that McGarry took, was that it really has, it, diabetes has its roots in defective fat metabolism. And so... I <laughs> just... You're how stuck on that. Would, how often would you have to do that a day? Yeah. <laughs> I guess it depends on how many patients you have. Oh, my goodness. Would they be sick? The doctors? Yeah. Would you, it's, would you want to not taste. order the test? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, again, a, a, a screwed up conversion here. I apologize. The point in this, and in th this, this um, data slide, I'm just going to take you through this very briefly was um, by David Kelly, who was my mentor back in Pittsburgh, um, who I went to, to study with, who was an endocrinologist, diabetologist. And he published this very important study, and what this showed was that non-diabetic controls versus people with type 2 diabetes um, had a big difference in their fat metabolism. And I'm not going to take you through all what this means, but essentially their glucose metabolism was defective, obviously, they had diabetes. But what they also showed, and this was specific to muscle, that their muscle's ability to burn fat was impaired. And this was, at the time, the first study to really objectively show that muscle's ability to burn fat in type 2 diabetes was, was impaired. And other, other groups at that time were showing some Similar things, again, I'm not going to take you through all this, but essentially showing you that when you have an impaired fat metabolism, this was related to your impaired glucose metabolism. Okay, All relates to insulin resistance leading to diabetes and this metabolic inflexibility that we now consider both impaired fat metabolism and impaired glucose or sugar metabolism. And so they wrote some review papers. Uh, well, this second paper here was a review paper. The first study was a weight loss and obesity paper that we published together um, that I'm going to talk to you about here. And what we showed was that when we had lean, normal weight, healthy subjects, these were non-exercise trained subjects, by the way, sedentary, <laughs> normal weight subjects, in fasting, they had lower leg RQ values, and just suffice it to say that this is um, better fat oxidation, fat burning by the muscle. And when you stimulated them with insulin, we actually infused insulin into the IV like you would get after a high carbohydrate meal, that these lean, healthy people rapidly switched from going from fat metabolism 
to better glucose metabolism. So they were metabolically flexible. The obese people, in contrast, were metabolically inflexible. So they burned less fat when they were supposed to burn fat, and they burned less glucose when they were supposed to burn glucose. So they just couldn't adapt to the situation to burn one energy source or the other. And again, this was specific to muscle. So what are the cellular characteristics? What are the mechanisms that might help explain why someone might not be burning fat as well as others and what, why some might not burn glucose as well as others? How might this contribute to ultimate uh, diabetes, for example? Well, we started doing a lot of these studies in which we would actually harvest a piece of tissue out of somebody's leg, and we do this fairly routinely with um, uh, muscle biopsies. Um, you go in under local anesthesia, you can clip off a piece of muscle, and you can look at a lot of different things in the muscle tissue. You can look at how much carbohydrates stored there, how much fat stored there. You can look at the measure the enzymes that are responsible for fat and glucose burning. Who and lets you do that? Huh? Who lets you do that? Stuff? I've had 18 done on myself. Have you really? Doesn't that hurt? Yeah, it's, a pressure. it's like more of a pressure. Your muscle doesn't have any pain receptors, so. Yeah. you got to love it when the, when the scientist is experimenting on himself. It's... Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> one of the things that we've been very interested in is mitochondria metabolism. If you don't know what mitochondria are, just know that they're the energy powerhouses of the cell. So they, again, they're the aerobic powerhouses that fuel aerobic metabolism, whether it's carbohydrate or fat oxidation. And so we wanted to know whether these mitochondria are implicated in this metabolic inflexibility. And the short answer is we still don't know, but this is kind of a process or a, a journey that we're on now to better understand why is it that young, lean, exercise trained people have lots of healthy mitochondria, um, they don't get diabetes, versus older, obese people, and particularly people with diabetes, they have less mitochondria, and what they have may be, may be dysfunctional. So, again, my, my mentor David Kelly published this study back in the early 2000s, in which they showed that when, we, when they looked at muscle tissue samples taken, and these are all human studies, when they looked at lean people compared to obese people and people with type 2 diabetes, the people with diabetes had significantly lower levels of mitochondria in the muscle. And this corresponded to their inability to burn fat and their insulin resistance and their diabetes. So the machinery responsible for burning energy was just simply not as, as robust um, in these people with diabetes. Now, could this be related to uh, exercise? Well, certainly. Um, we know that exercise, um, and particularly your ability to burn fat during exercise, is, is correlated to how much mitochondria you have in the muscle. So the more mitochondria you have in the muscle, the more fat burning capacity that you have in the muscle. So this is a direct correlation. This has been shown um, for many, many years. In fact, this was probably the first study ever to show that exercise increased mitochondria and muscle uh, by John Halsey and his group at Washington University in St. Louis. This was a rodent study, and they just simply compared rats who exercised versus rats who didn't, and they showed that the exercise rats had lots more mitochondria in the muscle compared to those sedentary uh, rats. So we wanted to see if this related, if exercise could do this in people, and particularly <laughs> at what level of exercise. You know, I, 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 you know, I talk about elite athletes, cross-country skiers, hummingbirds, sled dogs, but you know, the practical question is, you know, how much exercise do you need to do to get this effect. So, you know, the average person going into the doctor's office, can they do enough exercise to really make a difference in some of these parameters? Or, you know, do you just need to set your pacemaker a little higher? Yeah. I'm a little confused by having more or less or fewer mitochondria. Doesn't every cell have one? So would you, 
every cell would have one sure. mitochondria, right? So no, no. there be more or less? In no, no. Um, the amount of mitochondria per cell varies tremendously. Okay. So, so is that just in, in the size of them, or is there more than one? In some it's both the number and the size. Okay. Yeah. And I can tell you, and I don't, I, I didn't put this up here today, but if if we look at the uh, amount of mitochondria in a muscle sample from a trained athlete compared to just a normal average Joe on the street, um, the athlete's going to have two to three times the amount of mitochondria. So their mitochondria volume is going to be about five to eight percent of their total muscle volume, and the sedentary person is going to be two, two and a half percent. So lots more mitochondria. And a hummingbird, by the way, is 40%. You've got to have a lot of mitochondria if you're a hummingbird. So what we did, we took 70-year-old men and women. We had them do a 12-week exercise program. This was a modest walking program, brisk walking, basically. And we showed that their mitochondria increased by about 50%. So what this was showing, that you don't have to be an elite athlete to have more mitochondria. Um, that if you take normal sedentary people and you exercise them just moderately, they can have a profound effect on their um, mitochondria. In fact, when you look at their VO2 max changes, you know, I told you the VO2 max was the gold standard to measure somebody's aerobic fitness. It increased a seven, eight, ten percent. If you see a ten percent increase in somebody's VO2 max, their overall aerobic capacity with a training regimen, that's that's a big deal mitochondria are increasing 50%. So very sensitive parameter um, in response to exercise. Um, a quick question. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you talk about moderate exercise, are you talking about the amount of time that they're doing with the so they did. So they did three to four days a week, 30 to 45 minutes per session. Oh, just, just walking. Just walking. Just walking. Yeah. I mean, some of them did some stationary cycling. Um, but for the most part, it was just walking. So, so three to four times a week, yes. just walking would was be enough to see this response for thirty minutes, and that would thirty be to forty-five minutes, and that would be moderate. Would moderate. be something like that. I'm just trying yeah. to get the definition of what you mean yeah. by moderate. Yeah, that's moderate. Okay. Does that make are you clear yeah, on that yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. But that's Thank a really you. great solution for yeah. many people. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if it's just walking and you see that, that's pretty. Yeah. I mean, as you know, there's a lot of talk about high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is a program people can be compliant with. It's walking, so if you can get people to, to get up and move and walk, you can see some pretty pretty dramatic effects. Yeah, you. Is it possible to measure VO2 max on your own, or do you need to go to a medical facility? You can estimate it on your own, but you wouldn't. You would to to really measure it. You would need to go to a research facility that has the equipment to to measure the oxygen consumption part of it. Yeah. I mean, you can come up with reasonable estimates, but they're just going to be estimates. Yeah. So, one of the questions that we've had over the years, as you can imagine, working in the obesity space, is um, whether weight loss, you know, has some similar effects on metabolism as exercise. And you know, Jim Hill talked about this a little bit. You know, is it is it physical activity? Is it Obesity, is it weight loss? Is it increased exercise, physical activity? So we've been very interested in the metabolic space to compare the effects of exercise to weight loss in certain conditions, just obesity, diabetes, et cetera. And so one of the things that we found is that exercise promotes better fat oxidation, better mitochondria, more mitochondria, and these are just different enzymes. So the one on your left is one enzyme and the one on your right is another enzyme. But the pattern is the same, that exercise improves the capacity for better fat oxidation, overall aerobic capacity, but weight loss does nothing to it. So if you have <coughs> people enroll in a weight loss program and they don't exercise, it can have some positive benefits. It can lower blood pressure, it can improve uh, lower glucose, it can improve your insulin sensitivity, as we'll talk about here in a, min in a minute. But what it doesn't seem to do is promote better fat burning. It seems like exercise, physical activity, is really the key to do this. 
So, and by the way, um, I didn't put it up here because it's, it's also unpublished. We just finished a study in which we had uh, bariatric surgery patients uh, participate in a structured exercise program. These patients, these were gastric bypass patients, um, and our study was almost 130 patients. And um, so half got bariatric surgery without exercise, and the other half got the same surgery with an exercise program following their surgery. And we also showed that surgery did absolutely nothing to mitochondria function in the muscle, but exercise on top of the surgery had a significant improvement in your mitochondria function. So the take home message there that we're starting to, to uh, better understand is that um, while bariatric surgery can do a lot of great things, it doesn't do everything. So getting back to this metabolic flexibility and inflexibility in obesity, I showed you this earlier, right? The lean people respond they burn fat better when they're supposed to, and they burn glucose better when they're supposed to. The obese people don't. So how can you correct this? So if they just lose weight with a diet program, and I would even say, and I don't have a lot of hard evidence for this yet, but even with massive weight loss, loss with surgery, that your insulin sensitivity improves with weight loss. No question about it. And this is probably a big reason why weight loss is important to prevent diabetes. The Diabetes Prevention Program showed that, although the Di Diabetes Prevention Program was a combination of weight loss and physical activity, so it was hard to really to tease out what was having the, <coughs> the bigger effect. Was it weight loss? Was it the physical activity? But in our studies, the weight loss alone uh, clearly improves your sensitivity to insulin, and this is a good thing. So you're improving that side of the equation. You're improving your glucose metabolism in response to insulin. But your fat metabolism doesn't really change much with just weight loss. Now, in contrast, it looks like exercise in combination with weight loss does both. It improves your insulin sensitivity on the right, and it also improves your fat metabolism. So to improve both your fat metabolism and glucose metabolism, it looks like you need to not only do weight loss, but weight loss in combination with exercise. And this, you know, it seems intuitive, it seems logical, but there are a lot of people out there with this idea that, well, I don't need to exercise, I don't need physical activity, I just need to cut back on my calories and lose weight. And that's what most people do. Um, it, that's, that's the reality. Um, but what we're showing is that to really correct your impaired metabolism, you need to do both. And this study showed that and again, this is just a scatter plot showing a correlation. But the people, this was a combined exercise and weight loss program. The people who improved their fat metabolism the most also improved their insulin sensitivity the most. In other words, they were, you couldn't tease apart one for, from the other. When you exercise and dieted together, when you improved your fat metabolism, this was strongly related to your improved, your improved glucose metabolism. So again, you got, you got both. Versus the people who only improved glucose metabolism to a slight extent did not see the dramatic improvement in fat metabolism. And again, this was a study of combined exercise and weight loss showing that the exercise was important. This study's not ours. This was, study, uh, this was a study done in the Pima Indians. Dan Bessison talked to you about the Pima Indians earlier. And to break this down fairly simply, they did this longitudinal study in these Pima Indians. They tracked them over a period of time to follow their weight gain over time. And what they showed was that subjects in the green there who were better fat burners when they studied them at the beginning, gained less weight over time than the ones who were poor fat burners. So the take home message here was that if you were a good fat burner, you gained less weight over time than if you were a bad fat burner. Um, <coughs> now, let me also say that there's not a lot of other evidence out there in the literature to support this. There are studies here and there um, 
So this concept that better fat burning might relate to better weight loss or better maintenance of weight loss um, is really not something that's sort of set in stone yet. This is, this is one of those things that just really requires more research to, to, to figure out, okay? So the last thing I wanna, well, one of the last things I wanna get across is that um, we've, all re we've all read the articles about exercise in a pill, right? Um, and I'm gonna get up on my soapbox a little bit today and give you my opinion about some of this. Um, I love this cartoon, by the way. <laughs> This is, this is so real, right? Um, you know, miracle cream, right? Um, is it really a miracle cream? Is it really exercise in a pill? Um, I don't know, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, I, first of all, I think, you know, if you can do exercise, it's probably better than any pill that you could take that might mimic some of the effects of exercise. But the reality is some people can't exercise, and the other reality is some people just don't want to exercise. So that's why when we, you know, when we see on, uh, you know, in the newspaper or internet or CNN or whatever, you know, exercise in a pill, it gets tons of press. And that's, you know, a lot of people love this idea because most people don't like to exercise. <laughs> and wouldn't it be great if we had exercise in a pill? These guys are certainly interested in exercise in a pill because if they could, if they could come up with something that mimics some of the great things that exercise does, they would make billions of dollars, and they're, trust me, most of these companies are working on some form of exercise mimetic. Um, now look, I don't think we'll ever come up with a pill that does everything that exercise does. Lowers blood pressure, lowers lipids, increases your fitness, increases your insulin sensitivity, increases your mitochondria function. But if we had something that did some of those things, you know, I'll, I'll be a realist and recognize that, you know, these are probably important targets for these companies. Um, but do me a favor. When another study comes out, and like, and it's going to be an animal study, you know, mice on a running wheel or whatever, so the next super mouse, um, and they got a compound that makes, you know, the next super mouse, try to be a little skeptical <laughs> because so many times, you know, the press just runs with this and then people come to me and, and ask me, you know, what about this? And I try to give the other, you know, optimistic but other side of this because there's always another side. Because I'll tell you, the other reality is athletes get a hold of this in the press and then this exercise in a pill compound, the next thing you know, it's on the black market and athletes are taking this. Um, and who knows what untoward side effects some of these things have. So um, I think we all need to be a little bit skeptical um, about some of these exercise and appeal uh, types of studies when they come out. So these are all the people that have helped me along the way in, in putting a lot of this research together. Um, if we had a little time at the end, I was going to take you on a little bit of a journey. Do we have time? Uh, we have until 4 o'clock. Yeah. Do? So, so I want to make sure we leave time for questions. Yeah, no, so. I'm, I'm open for questions anytime. My, my next question is, does anybody have any idea where this photo I took was taken? No. The Islets of Langerham. <laughs> Alaska. Alaska? Is it the Arctic? Antarctica. Yeah, this was a photo I took in Antarctica. Um, <laughs> it kind of looks like the sea, doesn't it? Like like waves. Oh, it does. But it's, it's actually blue Antarctic ice. Oh my gosh. Wow. And so, this is a segue <laughs> into the last part. So, um, this guy who I did not know at the time asked me to go to Antarctica. And he wanted, he was a type one uh, guy with type one diabetes, Will Cross was his name, is his name. Um, he, um, he had this idea, he wanted to raise awareness and uh, research for, for diabetes. And his goal was to kind of basically take in the idea of a 10K run for your favorite, you know, condition or disease. And he wanted to cross Antarctica on skis to raise money for diabetes. And so he called it the ultimate walk. He had done, 
you know, mountain climbing expeditions, and he wanted to show people that just because you had type 1 diabetes didn't mean that you couldn't be physically active, so that was part of it. He wanted to engage, engage us at the University of Pittsburgh in this research to, to, uh, to do some things, so I thought, you know, this would be a really cool opportunity to do some, you know, uh, energy balance studies in somebody with diabetes, so, so after a couple of years of planning and a pilot study at the North Pole that they did, <laughs> Um, in which they helped us figure out how many calories that they would require to take with them to the South Pole um, because this was an unsupported expedition that they did. And I didn't do all of it. I did two weeks of it. They did 62 days. And they started at the edge of the continent and skied to the South Pole and they had to you know, pull all of their food and supplies in these sleds. So we worked with some dietitians to figure out how many calories that they would need, how many calories they would burn during this 62-day trek to the South Pole. Um, you know, these extreme conditions, you know, here he is, type 1 diabetes, if his insulin freezes, he's screwed basically because, you know, you can't, if you thaw it out, it won't work. So he's got to keep his insulin from, from freezing, so that was a challenge. Um, pulling, you know, pulling your own food, your tent and everything, no sled dogs in Antarctica. Um, anymore, they used to have them, but there's a moratorium on sled dogs. So, um, so this was self-supported, and so again, it was a 62-day trek from the edge of the uh, continent to the South Pole. And so, um, we helped them design this diet. And again, this was literally based on a pilot study that they did going to the North Pole. So they went to the North Pole on an, a short expedition, and we did some energy balance estimations to figure out how many calories that they would require. We put some activity monitors on them, some heart rate monitors, and estimated how many calories they burned in a day pulling this sled across the ice. And so we thought, okay, if they're burning that many calories, you know, you load up the sled with this many calories over 62 days and you won't start to death. Is that Vincent Massive? Um, this is not, but we were really close to that. Yeah, we were in the, uh, uh, Vincent Massive is the highest point in Antarctica. And so our base camp was actually pretty close to this uh, highest point in Antarctica. And so the, their diet goal was 6,500 calories a day. Um, this, is, this is about what Tour de France cyclists eat on a daily basis for three weeks during the Tour de France. So huge amount of calories. Um, fat is calorie dense like Jim Hill talked to you about. So um, it was actually a high fat diet. Um, we tried to design a, a high good fat diet, you know. Um, oils and um, nuts and these kind of things because um, again less weight more calories for the for the diet this was actually a just to show you a heart rate recording um, this is how we helped track energy expenditure this was actually mine when I did the two weeks with them and this is just to show you on scale here so this is six hours so we pulled our sleds for six hours six to eight hours a day um, they did it for 62 days. I was I wimped out and I only did it for two weeks. Um, so, uh, so this is just showing you my heart rate for six hours, and again, some days it was seven, some days it was eight, was about 150 beats per minute. So that you can see why we're getting huge energy expenditure. Um, you know, I was fairly fit. You know, I did triathlons, cy you know, cycle races, and I thought. Pff, you know, a couple weeks, you know, pulling my sled to the South Pole, how hard could that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sled weighed, weighed as much as I did, and, and trust me, this was not gliding across the sled, the ice. This was like just slaw, I mean, this was tough stuff. Um, yeah. When did you do this? So I did it in two, uh, 2002 um, is when we did this, um, and I never published this, so this is all unpublished data. Um, so we did a little energy balance study at N of 2. We had the, the guy with type 1 diabetes and then um, his, his friend, non-diabetic, um, also went. Mm -hmm. So this was their estimated energy expenditure between 56 and 7,300 calories a day that they're expending, um, pulling their sleds across the ice for 6 to 8 hours a day for 62 days. 
their average energy intake was about 4,000 calories. So you can see that despite our best intentions, trying to get them as much food as they needed, they were still in a pretty severe energy deficit. Um, between 1,500 and 3,500 calories a day. I can tell you that Will lost about 25 pounds and Jerry Peterson, his uh, non-diabetic counterpart, lost about 40 pounds in, in two months. Um, they knew that this was gonna happen, so they intentionally bulked up a little bit before the trip. Um, but you can see with this very extreme amount of physical activity, you just sim it's simply just very difficult to eat that many calories. So actually, to be honest with you, this was a way for me to ask any of you, if you want to partner with me, we could write a book, and it'll be a best-selling book. We'll call it The Antarctic Diet, <laughs> Lose Weight, <laughs> and Eat As Much As You Want. <laughs> eat 4,000 calories a day, no problem. Did you come with a sled? You just need a sled. <laughs> <laughs> expenditure for the type 1 diabetes is lower is that because he's he was lighter to begin with or is that the diabetes um, a little bit of both he was lighter so he just burned he's a smaller guy he yeah. burned burned less energy because of that um, the one thing that we didn't do a good job of was was account for the calories he lost in the urine being a diabetic you know because you lose calories in the urine you're it's a spillover right so if you're if your glucose is if you're yeah, if your glucose is, is high in the blood, it spills over into the urine. This goes back to the tasting, right? This is how they diagnose people with diabetes. So you literally lose calories in the urine, and we didn't do a good job of accounting for that in him. So this is probably a little bit of a, an underestimate. He probably lost some calories that way. Um, but, uh, but yeah. So were those initial ways of testing actually successful? The, the urine samples, the tasting samples. With well, on a, on a crude, time. I mean, if you, if you taste any any sugar, I mean, any non-diabetic wouldn't have any sugar in the blood. Okay, so yeah, so in any any sweetness at all would be an indicator of a diagno a diagnosis essentially of diabetes. Pretty brilliant. Yeah. 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 Does yeah. it make any difference to consume complex carbohydrates versus simple carbohydrates in terms of energy production? Um, energy production, you mean using the energy? Like if you consume carbo complex carbohydrates versus simple sugars and they be able to convert that into energy? Mm -hmm. um, in the setting of exercise, no, because this was actually part of my PhD thesis and we actually took um, people during exercise, we gave them simple sugars and complex carbohydrates. It didn't make any difference at all. They burned um, the complex carbs, the simple sugars, equally as well. The insulin response during resting was a little bit different. You know, you get a bigger insulin response with simple sugars. You know, you hear glycemic index, and that's essentially what that is, right? So the simple sugars give you a bigger glycemic index, bigger insulin response compared to complex carbohydrates. But as it turns out, when you exercise, exercise is the, is the leveler. It doesn't matter if it's simple sugars or complex carbohydrates. Um, they're all burned as effectively. But when it comes to people that don't exercise at all, what happens? Um, they just consume the simple sugars or simple carbs versus the other type. Well, as, as Jim Hill pointed out uh, a little while ago, when you take carbohydrates, whether it's simple sugars or complex carbohydrates in excess, what it does, people have this misconception that the carbohydrates are converted to fat, and I think that's partly what he was trying to talk to you guys about. What actually happens is that, and this, is, this gets this metabolic inflexibility thing, is that when you consume too many carbohydrates, your fat metabolism is shut down, or at least um, suppressed. So you don't necessarily just convert glucose into fat. What the excess glucose does is severely um, squashes or um, suppresses your fat oxidation, so you're burning less fat and then the calories that you're consuming as fat then are gonna be more likely to be stored. Does that make sense? But the carbohydrates do not necessarily just get converted directly to fat. Yeah. 
So we've been hearing about uh, the, the short, intense uh, training sessions helping people lose weight. Yeah. And I know you said that you don't burn fat during anaerobic exercise. Is there something else going on there? Well, I think a couple of things. We don't, um, we don't really know what's going on in recovery, too. So you're going to burn maybe more carbs during recovery and then, or during the exercise, and then during the recovery period is when you're going to store the carbohydrates more when you eat, and you're probably going to burn more, more fat. And also those... Keep in mind those those training bouts, like I showed here today, are going to help your muscles increase their ability to burn more fat as well. So, you know, again, that's the great thing about exercise. It trains the body to burn glucose well, and it trains the body to burn fat well. I mean, my, my only, and it's not really an issue, my only question about the, the high-intensity training programs, I think for some people, they're probably really good. For me, it really is going to come down to compliance. What people are going to stick to over the long term, if they stick to those programs and they like them, they're probably great, right? Um, but if they only do them for a couple weeks and they don't do them because they're too hard or whatever, then, you know, what good are they? Yeah. Well, it seemed like the message from earlier was if you can adopt a lifestyle with moderate exercise, simply, you know, walking 30 to 45 minutes, yeah. three to four times a week, yeah. you can affect these changes. It doesn't have yeah. to be, so that's the argument really, that it doesn't have right. to be a high intense um, no. activity level in your life, that you can have, uh, you know, eat, health, eat healthfully, have right. moderate exercise, have success. Yeah, it seems exactly. But keep in mind, you know, when, when I talk about moderate exercise, I'm talking about brisk walking. I'm not talking about doing your... Uh, your uh, work at a at a standing so treadmill it's brisk desk. Walking. Okay. I, mean, I, I think that's a different so issue. So what, what, like a heart rate level of 140, 150, oh, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, you know, like if your maximum heart rate is, you know, 160, you know, like 70% of your maximum heart rate or something like oh, that. That's pretty brisk. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If you undertake an exercise program for six months and then you stop, can you estimate how long do you retain those benefits physically? How, how long is it before you are mm -hmm. back to where, where yeah. you were before you started exercising? Yeah, so that's, that's the negative part of this, right? That's the sort of depressing side that you get these great adaptations with training, but when you detrain um, or you stop exercising, the time course, there's not a lot of good time course research or studies, but from what I know, the time course is about the same. Um, and, but it depends on it depends depends on the severity. I mean, if if you look at if you look at um, uh, bed rest, for example, hospitalization, um, you know, zero activity, you lose. I mean, it's amazing what you lose very rapidly. And what I tell people, particularly in older people, and we're doing some studies on this now, when older people are hospitalized. Um, for 10 days, it's like five years of aging in 10 days. That's what it does to the muscle. Your muscle, you lose about uh, one to two percent of your entire muscle mass in 10 days with, with just a hospitalization or bed rest. So it's very important to figure out, you know, how to counteract this, uh, obviously. So that weight loss in hospital rest is not, I mean, you're saying there can be massive amounts of weight loss, they're, but that's not a good thing. They're losing a lot of muscle too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did have a question actually yeah. that you touched on, which was the benefits of sleep with mm -hmm. weight loss. You're talking about periods of fasting and how, yeah. and, and we do that when we sleep. So right. what's your feeling about the role of sleep in weight loss or in, you know, mitochondria growth? Yeah. I mean, you know, lots of studies done on relating sleep uh, duration and sleep quality on metabolism and obesity. Um, I, there's something there. It's not really. It's not really my expertise, but I do think there's something about um, sleep quality and metabolism. I mean, that's that's been borne out in the in the research for sure. Uh, an association between um, you know less sleep and diabetes, less sleep and heart disease. So uh, I think sleep is tied into a lot of things. I mean, we know that exercise affects sleep quality, uh, affects mood. So I think, it, you know, it's, it's hard to distinct, you know, to disentangle this, right? I mean, exercise, physical activity is probably related to sleep duration, sleep quality. Um, we just don't know about how much 
exercise or how much physical activity is optimal for the best sleep and these kind of things. So, yeah. but, it's, but it's all tied in. Aging, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but um, particularly after kids, I'm, I'm 47, but I, I, the older I get, the, I, I feel like my sleep is not as good as I wake up more. When I was in my 20s, I can't remember waking up during the mm -hmm. sleep. I slept through the night all the time. Not anymore. And I exercise a lot, so I, you know, there's, there's something going on there. Other questions? Going once? All right, well, good, Pastor. Thank you so much.